Hello everyone, uh, welcome to today's global politics class. Um, so it's the first proper lesson really after the essay. Uh, I'm marking the essays today. Um, I've just finished my year 13 history coursework. So I am doing the essays today. Um, hopefully I'll get them back to you today or tomorrow. Um, you had some reading last week to prepare you for this last topic. We are moving to the last topic of Global Politics Unit 1, which is this huge unit we've been doing. Um, and this topic is, can global interactions improve the world? Okay, um, so the key concept for this topic is global interactions. We're looking at how, basically how uh, states um, and other organizations interact at the global level, not at the local national, but at the global level, um, and how international relations operates. Now, just remind yourselves, in this first unit, we've looked at four things, essentially. We've looked at the nature of power, which was an introduction to all the theory and the different ways of viewing global power realism, liberalism, etc. Then we looked at states as like the main actors in global politics. Remember, realists believe that states are the most powerful actors in global politics and will remain so. So we've looked at the history of states um, and how the concepts of sovereignty and legitimacy are really important to how they operate. Then we just completed this big unit looking at um, political actors other than the state. So we looked at non-state actors like NGOs, IGOs, political parties. These actors operate at different levels at the local, national, international level. Um, and actually we've seen how they can actually force states to do certain things and they can actually be if we look at multinational corporations even more powerful than states in some respects. Okay, so we're going to finish this topic by looking at, okay, how do all these different actors, states and non-state actors, how do they actually interact? So the kind of le lessons we're going to look in this unit, we're going to look at today something called global governance. Then we're going to look at the role of uh, treaties and alliances, um, how they work. Then we're looking at a concept called collective security, um, alliances, um, interdependence as a concept and informal cooperation. So we're really looking at how the global politics works in this unit. Okay, so we're going to start today with this first lesson, how does global governance work? So make sure you put that title in your notes. Um, all the instructions are on the Google Classroom today. So there are lots of activities on the website. I don't want you to do all the tasks but I've summarized the ones I do want you to do. It's a fairly big lesson today because it's a new topic um, and there is a, a PowerPoint I want you to go through, a Google slide first, just to make the core notes and then to go back and complete these tasks. Homework is um, on the website. If we scroll down to where it says case study, because we're looking at specific case studies in this unit, um, we're looking at the Paris Climate Agreement as an example of global governance. And instead of doing this individually, I've actually put a link on the classroom to this Padlet. I've created a Padlet and I want you as a group of seven students to put all your research on this Padlet. Um, you should be able to edit this um, and on a Padlet you just double tap and you can add a new post where you can link in information, you can write in lots and lots of information, you can resize the box, you've got lots of different options for what evidence you put in the box. You might like even like to screenshot certain quotations maybe. Um, that's what I'd like you to do. Remember on Padlet these three little dots on each post um, mean you could connect to other posts. I can send a label this way and call my label cheese. There you go. Um, and you'll notice that it also puts your name above each post you make and you can actually comment and rate each other's posts. So if you think someone's done a particularly good post um, you can add that in there. So that's your homework to be done this week. I want you to try and get your classwork done today. Um, I'm just going to finish today by just briefly going through the uh, Google Slides just to introduce the concept to you. Um, so let's remind ourselves, our statement of inquiry for this topic is globalization encourages greater interdependence amongst states, which can lead to new forms of positive and negative interaction. And the image in the background really summarizes this, this part of the unit, topic four. Um, 
globalization in the 20th century, especially after the Second World War, has really increased. New technologies like the TV, the radio, uh, internet, uh, cellular, mobile technologies, they've really made the world small, connected us up in new ways. And that's led to really... Um, positive growth in world technology and human development. We've seen how the internet, even right now, is leading us to like change education in radical ways. Um, but it's also led to a lot of negative interaction. So globalization has also led to the spread of uh, things across the world, like pandemics, like coronavirus, but also terrorism. And how states deal with this new international system that is highly globalized is a really interesting topic that we're going to explore. So our key concept is global interactions. As a concept, how does that work? We're also looking at something called interdependence. That's our main politics concept. So how do states become dependent on each other? And what is the positive and negative kind of um, impact of that for states and how they operate? So uh, <clears throat> to start with today, you should be writing down this definition of global governance. You'll have time to go back and do this yourselves. Um, <clears throat> and it says here, global governance is the way that states organize themselves, make agreements and tackle shared challenges above the national level, usually through IGOs with clear rules. <clears throat> now, the trouble I have with global governance is it's not really a thing. Um, it's not when you hear the phrase global governance, that it's not like an organization with a building and a headquarters. It refers to a whole host of different things. Simply, global governance is this idea we've come, come up with to describe how the world interacts with each other. We don't, as you know, have a world government in which everyone respects um, a certain leader or country. Instead, there are many different sources of authority and sovereignty in the world. And we use global governance as a phrase to just kind of explain all of that stuff that goes on above the state that isn't really regulated highly. Um, because we do have rules in the world. The world does seem crazy. Even wars have rules to them. Um, so there's a whole host of processes going on at the global level that we don't see that but is actually regulated via global governance. So simply, it is a concept we use in global politics to describe all the processes and interactions that happen above the level of the state. Um, so it's just the current form of international cooperation we have. So that is what global governance is. Um, why do we need to bother to study it? Well, that's a really interesting question because, you know, there's loads to study in global politics. So why global governance? Um, so we've looked at in this course how states operate at the national level. Um, we've looked at how um, non-state actors operate at the local and regional levels, but we haven't looked at how politics operates at the global level. Um, so studying global governance really helps us to understand um, how states interact and how that interdependence works. And that's important because realist theorists, as you know, those people that believe in realism, they would argue that global governance isn't a thing, that it's impossible um, they believe that states can't work together at the international global level because states are self-interested, they're egotistic, um, and they are always be work thinking about the national interest. And there is a certain truth to that if we think of how Trump's America has turned its back on the world. Whereas liberals argue, no, countries can work together and it's the mechanisms of global governance that are the best chances we have to kind of solve global issues like climate change. So your beliefs and feelings and theories about global governance, whether it's actually a thing or whether we should actually pursue it, is really important because it dictates how you might view the possibility for solving problems in the world. And I always think it's nice to be positive and a liberal in certain things. Okay, on the next slide there are some key features of global governance. Um, I'm going to let you go through that in your own time and note them down. There's some key words there to put to your notes. Um, they try <laughs> Those five things, try and define global governance in a bit more detail. Um, so I'll let you explore that. Um, but what I wanted to highlight is alternatives to global governance, because there are many different alternatives. Um, 
Now, remember, go back to our definition. If global governance is just the concept we have to describe um, the current level of cooperation in the world, then that does imply that there could be other forms of cooperation and organization in the world system. And there are. And on these two slides, we're going to look at some alternatives to global governance. So let's begin with the first one. This is kind of like what realists believe the world is. This is the international anarchy. So the, the globe, the global politics, you could argue, doesn't have any rules. It is just anarchical. There is no supreme authority. Um, there is only states. And these states have to look after themselves because there's no um, supranational authority. So in international anarchy, there is no chance for global governance. But that doesn't mean everyone's killing each other all the time. Um, peace can be achieved via a balance of power, um, which happens throughout history, as the, you've seen in the Cold War. So is the global system one of international anarchy? That's one viewpoint you could take. The other is global hegemony. Um, some realists would argue that some form of global governance is possible due to regional or global hegemony. So some would argue, well, yes, the world is anarchical, but what if one state becomes so big and powerful that um, it manages to enforce its own rules on the west of the globe uh, and you could argue the USA has done that since 1945 and especially since the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, how does that work? Well other smaller states basically go through this bandwagoning process where they essentially agree to what the global hegemon wants because they just want to survive. So in theory, you can have a world government if one nation or group of nations become hegemonic powers. Um, but that isn't genuine global governance. It isn't genuine cooperation. Um, realists would argue that's just a manifestation of the power of one state. So that might be the USA. Um, the third alternative to global governance is world government. So if you imagine the UN being an actual world government with like democratic voting um, and decision making, that would be a world government. And philosophers throughout history have kind of tried to describe this as a, a positive thing. People like Gandhi and a statesman like Churchill, they also advocated for world government in some of their writings as a way to solve the problem of anarchy. And it operates just like the state operates to solve anarchy at the national level. Remember, we looked at that lesson on social contract theory by Thomas Hobbes and Immanuel Kant. Um, Thomas Hobbes des described a government as a leviathan, a big monster that can prevent conflict amongst uh, s smaller people below it. Is that even desirable? Some people would argue a well world government could end in a world kind of dictatorship or a world authoritarianism um, and that's sort of scares many people so lastly what we have global governance itself if all of those options are, are a bit too unpalatable for everyone then i guess the, the best system is the one we currently have and that's global governance um so we do know that states are capable of cooperating voluntarily. They do it all the time. Um, and if we don't want to give up our power and sovereignty to a world government, then perhaps the best thing to do is to work out how best it is that we can cooperate. And that might be described as global governance. So how has it evolved over time? Um, global governance has always been there. You know, states, there's always been treaties, um, if you look in European history especially. Um, and there's always been rules, laws, treaties, alliances that have always regulated the behaviour of states. We've always had these. But I guess it's really sped up and deepened since World War II. You could argue that since World War II, we've had a US-led kind of regime of global governance, of world governance, um, and that was very deliberate. Towards the end of World War II, in August 1944, um, the USA and its allies, which the USA called the United Nations at the time, they met in uh, America in a place called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, and they met to describe 
and to build the governance of the world after World War II. So once Hitler is destroyed and Japan's defeated, what organizations are we going to create in the world um, to improve the governance? And that's what they came up with. It's called the Bretton Woods system. And they came up with a series of institutions there um, you got the what was called the International Bank for Reconstruction that became known as the World Bank. You got the International Monetary Fund and the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs (GATT), um, which was renamed the World Trade Organization. Now, between them, these three international organizations, these three IGOs, um, regulate how the world is run politically and economically. Um, but these are mostly economic institutions. The United Nations was also set up by the Americans to kind of organize the world politically. So together, these three institutions of the Bretton Woods system um, have regulated the global economy up until this day. There is a challenge from China, and China is creating its own um, IGOs to kind of introduce its form of governance. Um, and that was the dominant way the world has been organized, I would say, in my lifetime and other people's lifetimes. So please read through those to take some notes on how that works. Um, so there are different sort of political perspectives that you can take on global governance. Some people think it's a good thing. Some would argue it isn't. And you do need to write some notes on this. So the liberals believe that global governance is the new reality of the global system. It's how states should interact um, to solve problems. They would argue global governance is a good thing. We should have more rules in, in the world to kind of stop anarchy. Um, and they would argue states have a mutual interest in upholding rules. That's why states agree to gov governance. The USA agrees to curtail some of its power in these organizations because it creates a better world. And if you look at all the growth of IGOs over the past 50 years, that would kind of prove this theory correct. However, we do know that in some places in the world, like the Middle East, some parts of Africa, there really hasn't been much in terms of governance. So that might indicate that there is still anarchy and realism in the world. Realists, as you can imagine, argue that global governance is a fiction. States only cooperate to advance self-interest. Uh, the current US-led regime of global governance is just a manifestation of US power, and I'm sure China would agree with that. But as we know, even the USA, the most powerful nation, has disagreements with the UN and other IGOs, which does show there is a kind of independent um, force of governance in the world that opposes even the hegemonic power. So that's interesting. Obviously, you, you've seen these views before. They go a bit weird. Social constructivists would argue uh, global governance is a really good thing. Uh, as states become more interdependent, they become more like each other through um, building a community. Uh, and then they change their own identities. If you look at the European Union and how nations have changed their identity via global governance and rules, um, Brexit kind of blows that theory out the water because it that shows that actually um, it can work the other way. States can decide not to want to share an identity. That's interesting. Marxists would just argue that global governance is um, basically set up by hegemonic capitalist states like the USA in order to enforce their power on the working classes of the world to transfer their wealth from um, the developing world to the developed world. And there's some really interesting writing about that. And you could argue, especially since the 1980s, that the USA, through its IGOs, has pursued policies for the developing world that have been terrible for the developing world, um, sort of forcing these nations to open up trade to the world markets, um, stop these nations from protecting their own economies. And if you especially look at South America um, and Africa, some of these nations have been plunged into debt by these global governance institutions. So Marxists would say, well, that's intentional because capitalists are evil. So that's it. That's global governments. Uh, go back over the notes for that. There are some readings as well, but you've got some tasks to do today. Lots of nice videos to watch to really try and understand this concept. I'm looking forward to seeing your homework on the Padlet there. Any questions, let me know on the Hangout. Otherwise, good luck.